and welcome to COVID-19, Keeping Up with a Moving Target. I'm your moderator, Faith Rogers, with DKB Med. Thank you for joining us. We are pleased to welcome our expert faculty members, Dr. Vega and Dr. Chinchia. Um, thank you so much to both of you for your time today. Thank you, Faith. Great to be here. Likewise. Fantastic. And these are the faculty's disclosures today. This educational activity is supported by an independent educational grant from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. All activity content and materials have been developed solely by the planning committee members and faculty presenters. The learning objectives for today's program are to describe current management strategies and identify potential treatments for COVID-19, for mild to moderate COVID-19, um, and to evaluate best practices for managing patients with COVID-19 using monoclonal antibodies and other agents. Um, also to describe the current management strategies and identify potential treatments for COVID-19 requiring hospitalization. Um, as a reminder, uh, this is current as of today, um, that's August 24th. So if you're watching this on demand or maybe the podcast, uh, just please do keep that in mind. Um, and do refer to the IDSA and NIH websites for the most up-to-date guidance. I will hand this off to Dr. Vega. Dr. Vega, thank you so much for your time. All right, Faith, thanks so much, and thanks for pronouncing uh, those monoclonal antibodies for us. You're getting us off to a flying start today. Um, thanks to everybody who's uh, taking the time uh, to watch this presentation. I know that uh, we're all really busy with our clinical practices, with everything else going on. Um, it's been a very stressful time, and, uh, and so we appreciate you taking the time to, uh, to talk with us. And make sure you put your thoughts, ideas, and questions um, into the Q&A box. Uh, we'll be addressing those as time allows at the end. Um, I'm here to manage the outpatient course uh, section of this discussion, and uh, it's because that's where I work is in the outpatient uh, setting. And then uh, Denora is going to cover the inpatient setting and management of COVID-19. And so, of course, I'm going to promote my own section by saying that uh, we in the outpatient sector see most of the patients with COVID-19. So uh, while certainly we're worried about stewardship and keeping patients out of the emergency department, keeping them out of the ICU so we can preserve those beds for those who really need it, you know, 80, over 80 percent of individuals with COVID-19 have mild to moderate illness and they should be treated as outpatients. And this is a nice graphic representation of uh, the virology, the symptomatology, and incorporates treatment of uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. So we can see that uh, it, it, the viral load builds up, of course, before patients become symptomatic. So they're most, they're most infectious probably right before they become symptomatic, um, which is different than other viral illnesses. And then I think the other thing to note is, particularly if for folks who are more debilitated, immunocompromised, they can shed virus for a very long time, um, which, you know, it's questionable how, how viable the virus is at three weeks after the presentation with symptoms. Uh, but if you're trying to test these patients, uh, you can expect you're going to continue to get positive testing. And that's not necessarily a great way to, uh, to understand how they're doing clinically. Um, you get the symptomatology, I think, is, is probably familiar. Of course, we watch in the second week where patients who could be doing uh, very well in week one, particularly those with risk factors for complications, get that increased inflammation uh, starting around day five, day seven. Um, and that's where they get more respiratory distress, which is what leads many individuals to seek emergency care and wind up under Dr. Chinchilla's care in the ICU, unfortunately. How do we abate that? Um, it's by initiating treatment early. So we think about using any antiviral drug, which includes these monoclonal antibodies we're thinking about, not using fresh frozen plasma as much um, anymore, um, or I'm sorry, the plasma from people who were infected rather, uh, but uh, that still could be a, a you know, viable alternative uh, down the line. Whereas the immunomodulating agents uh, which uh, Dr. Chinchia will cover, is, uh, that's really used more as, as that inflammatory process increases, as patients uh, generally enter the hospital. Of course, we, no case of COVID is, is, uh, is absolutely uh, the way all cases of COVID go. You see one case, you've seen one case, I've seen cases that get very severe very quickly, and cases where patients were asymptomatic their entire infection despite having multiple risk factors. But this is generally how it goes, and it's a good level set. Uh, one thing I do have a lot in my practice working in a 
Community Health Center in Santa Ana, California, is a lot of folks with these high risk conditions. I'm not going to uh, name them all. Generally, if you have more than one condition, uh, they are additive, increasing your risk of complications of COVID-19. And this list is changing and, and mutable. I would just call out in a recent meta-analysis that COPD was uh, really that came out on top in terms of its overall risk of producing complicated COVID-19 versus some of these other risk factors. Um, and both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, there was a question about type 1 diabetes. Now it's been confirmed. They're both independent uh, risk factors for complicated COVID-19. And what's not on this list, but it's really quite real in my practice, where I take care of a primarily Latinx uh, population, is uh, the racial and ethnic disparity we see in COVID-19. It's uh, you see disparities in terms of the infection rate overall. Uh, we see uh, disparities in terms of the rate of hospitalization and mortality. So when we think about American Indian, Alaska Native, um, Asian, uh, Hispanic persons, uh, Black and African Americans, and Hispanic and Latino persons uh, compared with whites, you can see the statistics here that uh, you can see that particularly those uh, those the American Indian, Alaska Native, Black, and uh, Latinx groups are particularly uh, and disproportionately affected. And so, and, and so they're more likely to go use that resources. I try to be a good steward because we get uh, notices every hour, I'm sure that Dr. Chinchi is aware too, about how our ED is saturated. Um, and now we get notice as well that her ICU is also saturated. Um, this, is, this is back. Uh, we thought we were out we're back uh, to to those to those levels, and um, and it has to do uh, with the fact that a lot of individuals um, in these communities uh, that the community I'm come from and that I care for is um, they are folks who live uh, with multiple generations of family, all living in cramped conditions. Many frontline workers there, and just difficulty um, you know with means to 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 practice good infection control. If you have you know seven people in a one bedroom apartment, it's it's just not possible. Also, um, individuals who are poor um, and don't always have access to primary care uh, often use the emergency room as their primary care resource. So that's another thing that, you know, and that goes back decades. That's, that's nothing new. Uh, but as we'll talk about, COVID-19 has really magnified some of these problems with health disparities, particularly in low-income communities of color. And, and so that's something that, you know, that we have to you know, try to manage and really are working to, uh, to prevent as much as possible, of course, with vaccination. But I think it's also important to note that this is not a, um, you know, there's not a biological, you know, strong case here. It's not a difference in the ACE2 receptor. It's not a difference in, you know, a person's immune system based on their race and ethnicity. It's really uh, poverty um, and being uh, in a situation where if you don't work and you have an income, if you do not have an income, you could possibly be evicted in the coming weeks. So um, I think that that's important. No, it's really the social determinants of health that we return to um, towards the end of this presentation uh, that are promoting these higher risks among people of color. So what are good practices for ambulatory patients? And I'm not going to go uh, through these, uh, you know, in too much detail because you all have some experience. If you have, you know, great insights, I would, I would love to hear it. But I do a lot of symptom supports, at least you can do. Of course, you can give antipyretics, analgesics. I'm pretty liberal with those. They are, are not associated with a worsening of illness. There were trials that actually that were underway because there was the possibility that NSAIDs might actually improve the course of illness. I have not seen any positive results from that, but they do make patients feel better, at least temporarily, so it's worth doing. Um, monitoring them via telehealth every couple of days until they really are on the mend and improving quite a bit from, uh, from their COVID-19 infection. And then the rules uh, for isolation have not changed in some time. They've been actually pretty stable over the past several months. Um, do not uh, test people, generally speaking, for uh, with a PCR test uh, so they can be cleared from isolation and go back to work because many of those patients uh, might be positive, but their rate of infectiousness is very low. So what about these um, antibody-based therapies? These have become increasingly important in our armamentarium, and really they are the way uh, we treat this mild to moderate uh, disease population who is at high risk for complications of, um, of COVID-19. And the reason we use them is because they work. Um, this is a trial, large trial, casarivimab plus indevimab. Um, one thing I'll point out is that uh, in these trials, uh, the majority of patients had a significant uh, 
risk for complications of COVID-19. I'll also point out across these trials, there is very strong diversity, much more than we see in normal clinical trials in terms of the racial and ethnic uh, makeup of patients. And, and I think that's a couple of things. One, it's intentional. We want to get more people of color into clinical trials. Two, it's a necessity during this uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, people of color, as I mentioned, have been disproportionately affected. So that's who has uh, COVID. Um, and three, I think that this is important to to demonstrate that these drugs you know, really can work in a diverse uh, you know, patient sample. And there have been intentional efforts made uh, to be more inclusive um, in these trials. Now, how do they work? Uh, these monoclonal antibodies have been effective and particularly effective with the outcome of um, hospitalization or death. So looking at the use of clinical resources. So individuals randomized uh, to castorivimab plus indevimab, you can see have a significant reduction, even at a lower dose than used previously of uh, the monoclonal antibodies uh, versus a group that received placebo. So a 71% risk reduction, which falls very well into our concept of good stewardship, of keeping the patients isolated at home, helping them feel better at home. Um, in this study, uh, not in every study with monoclonal antibodies, but in this study in particular, there was a significant reduction in duration of symptoms as well. And importantly, that, that lower dose um, allows us to potentially overcome one of the main barriers uh, to using monoclonal antibodies, and that is that the fact that uh, these treatments are given via an IV infusion. Uh, the infusion takes about an hour. Patients have to be monitored for an hour afterwards for complications. And so just setting up a center, particularly if you're in an under-resourced setting that can do IV infusions, I think is one of the severe rate limiting steps here, particularly as we came out of the height of the pandemic, you know, in the United States, we're, I'm thinking about February and March, where we had an infusion center, we had algorithms that finally, at first it was very intimidating uh, to send, uh, try to send somebody over there because there were a million boxes to check. But then we, we, create, we got a ton more efficient and were able to get patients in the same day they started symptoms at times. Um, great, because the earlier you start these therapies, uh, the better. Now we're kind of, we wound down uh, the infusion center, and now we don't really have a replacement as we're seeing yet another surge, um, you know, with the Delta variant. It's, uh, it's very, very depressing, uh, but very necessary to get these treatments back on board. So, therefore, that's why it's very important to point out that um, the emergency use authorization, or EUA, for castorvirumab plus and devimab was expanded to consider the use of subcutaneous treatment, which has been shown to be effective uh, when IV treatment is not, uh, not available. So that is important to consider when you're thinking about systems of care and if an infusion center or some other resource is not available where you can do IV infusions, sub-Q is better than nothing is essentially what the FDA was saying. So trovimab is another relatively new kit on the block. This one's got its EUA in May of 2021. Similarly, uh, similar based trial with a, a randomized trial versus placebo. IV infusion of citrovimab uh, was associated with a significant reduction in the uh, risk of hospitalization or death. Um, and this trial was stopped early because uh, it was so successful. And there are ongoing studies, uh, you know, combining different monoclonal antibodies together. Um, this has become necessary. This is uh, even more new, uh, and I'll talk about why it's necessary in a second. Uh, in terms of a, it's a real world study looking at monoclonal antibodies. It looks at one uh, U.S. urban center um, in cases of COVID-19, patients who received monoclonal antibodies or not, and they were compared with uh, historically a population before December 2020 when these monoclonal antibodies weren't available in the center. And how did patients do? How did they do in terms of further healthcare use, use of an emergency department, use of uh, or being hospitalized? And overall, uh, impressive results uh, for this group that received, really they were receiving banlimumab back in those days um, uh, or nothing. And the group that received banlimumab as a monoclonal antibody had an 82% uh, reduction in the risk of ED visit or hospitalization. So, so good results, strong results in clinical trials, good results when applied in the real world. And so I think that that's, uh, that's something that you know, really sets monoclonal antibodies apart as a, uh, as a primary therapy for folks who, um, have out, who are outpatients, who have COVID-19 at risk of complications. So I mentioned, you know, why are we, you know, seeing uh, new agents and why are they being combined in different ways? Um, it's because of variants. And so this is something that is very much a uh, moving target. And so uh, banlimumab plus etzimumab uh, was one of the first agents, uh, well, banlimumab monotherapy, later adding at Sivimab, and these are just different monoclonal uh, antibodies that, that bind to different epitopes of the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. 
Uh, and we saw changes as, um, as we went from the beta variant to the gamma variant and now with the delta variant. Um, there is uh, there have been high rates of resistance to bamlinib plus atzimab. So really, it's not it, it ceased distribution a couple months ago, um, and so therefore it's not you know considered a therapy. Whereas you know fortunately at this point, casirivimab plus indevimab, sotrovimab have not seen those same levels of resistance. Um, and this is why it's so important to catch up and try to vaccinate everybody and really work on driving down the global. Uh, prevalence of uh, COVID-19, because that will drive down the uh, development of these further variants, which inevitably could be uh, resistant to our effective monoclonal antibodies as they stand right now. So it's also important we have to keep experimenting, developing different antibodies, uh, using different combinations, and at the same time, mostly uh, driving down uh, the source of all those variants, uh, which is you know, just, just this huge number of infections worldwide. So very importantly, who should qualify for monoclonal antibody therapy? So it's patients exclusively who are outpatients right now, and they are at high risk for complications of COVID-19. They have to be at least 12 years of age, and they have to present within 10 days of symptom onset, but you really want to get them in ASAP within the first couple of days of symptoms. I feel like this treatment is going to be much more effective. They do have to be monitored. Even if you're giving a sub infusion, you have to monitor them for uh, an hour after uh, that infusion. And you have to be able to do something in case there is a, a complication. Fortunately, as we've used more and more of these monoclonal antibodies in clinical practice, um, there was a very rare signal that there could be a case of anaphylaxis, and that is still possible, these severe uh, types of reaction. Uh, but they have not really panned out in terms of, of the wider application in clinical practice. It does not seem to be a, it's something to be mindful of, but is it common? No, it's extreme, it seems to be extremely rare um, now that the monoclonal antibodies are being used more in community-based settings. And so what are the risk factors uh, that are in, uh, included in the EUA? Uh, this has been simplified, and it's a, it's a fairly long uh, list, but um, a couple I'll call out. Neuro, neurodevelopmental disorders, I've really been keen to get my patients. Uh, so many patients I see have um, cerebral palsy and other conditions. Um, and so therefore, I'm really pushing for them to get vaccinated and very much thinking about them receiving monoclonal antibodies should they become uh, sick. Um, these can be used, used in pregnancy as well. And, uh, and so that's, uh, that's also a strong consideration. And if you have a patient who really is maybe on the borderline with some of these conditions, but doesn't, you know, maybe it's, it doesn't qualify because they're 64 years of old, but, uh, but they, and they, they just have hypertension or something like that, um, I would, I, the, the EUA allows you to use your clinical judgment. You, you might still refer that patient for monoclonal antibody therapy. So these are recommendations from the National Institutes of Health and from the Infectious Disease Society of America, uh, which promote the use of casirivimab plus indevimab or sertrovimab. Either one is fine. But these may change. A couple uh, new things to, to watch out for. Uh, that we use um, prophylaxis against infections, say, with influenza. We know that anti-influenza drugs are good at prophylaxis against influenza. Well, it turns out you, you, know, you can use these monoclonal antibodies as prophylaxis for household contacts. And this is a study that randomized individuals to um, casirivimab plus indevimab or to placebo as prophylaxis when there was a household contact uh, with COVID-19. And you can see overall, uh, there was a strong uh, risk reduction in uh, developing either symptomatic or asymptomatic infection. And you know, as you might expect, for folks who did become infected with COVID-19 as household contacts, uh, their infection was less severe if they received the monoclonal antibodies versus receiving placebo. So now we have an expanded EUA as of July 30th, uh, which states that if people are at high risk and they're either unvaccinated or expected to have an inadequate uh, vaccine response, so they're immunocompromised in particular, um, they may be considered uh, for a monoclonal antibody as prophylaxis against uh, COVID-19 if they have that significant exposure, which really isn't much, again, especially if you think about um, household contacts, especially living in, excuse me, in tight quarters. And then uh, and we, uh, we use these agents. They are just for outpatients, so I want to make that very clear. Um, previously, monoclonal antibodies were tested among inpatients, and the results were negative. They didn't, uh, they didn't improve those patients. But maybe there, there might be a way that we employ these among inpatient care. Because if you look at the recovery trial, and this is nearly 10,000 hospitalized patients, um, and it's an open label uh, trial with casirimab or indevimab plus, you know, versus standard of care, 
overall, the monoclonal antibody, similar to the previous trial, did not really improve uh, their, the outcomes uh, compared with placebo. But in the subgroup of people who did not uh, mount a strong immune response uh, to their infection, which is a lot of immunocompromised folks, it's debilitated folks who are at the highest risk for complications of COVID-19, uh, there was a reduction in mortality. So this might be a path forward for using monoclonal antibodies again. Uh, among inpatients but right now it's just for again outpatients 12 years and old 12 years of age and over and on that long list of potential um, co conditions that could uh, complicate COVID-19. And with that I'm happy to turn it over to Genorna and she's gonna uh, despite our best efforts in that outpatient setting and getting those monoclonal antibodies on board some patients are inevitably going to be admitted so uh, and this is where we hand it over to great physicians like Dr. Chinchia. Oh that's very kind of you Chuck thank you for that very gentle transition. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start and kind of get straight into it. We're, we have a couple of drugs that we're gonna kind of review. So let's start with some of our uh, medications that we have in our back pocket. So let's start with antivirals. We have uh, remdesivir. Um, it was one of our first drugs that got um, authorized in the use of the inpatient side. So basically they use remdesivir versus placebo. And, uh, the primary outcome that looked at the, uh, during this trial was time to recovery. And there was a reduction in time to recovery um, and a difference of about five days in the two different groups. Uh, and then in the beginning, at 15 days, there were some trends to show that maybe there was some mortality uh, benefit trends, but that was lost at like 29 days. Uh, but if you look even closer as far as like the differences in the proportion of recovery between remdesivir and placebo, in the overall groups and do a subgroup analysis of who uh, had the most benefit. Um, and, and you can see by these graphs that the patients receiving oxygen had the most benefit. The difference between uh, the remdesivir and placebo here is much greater than overall. Um, and then uh, compared to the patients not receiving oxygen. And then when you look at the patients that were beyond uh, requiring nasal cannula, uh, and therefore using high flow or non-invasive mechanical ventilation or being on mechanical ventilation or ACMO, that benefit was actually lost. So although there's a difference in patients not receiving oxygen, the greatest difference was seen in the patients receiving oxygen. Uh, some of the adverse events that uh, they were looking at, there was actually a reduction of patients progressing onto respiratory failure when they received remdesivir, and there was a, a difference in serious adverse events and being less in the remdesivir group. So based on those uh, and that literature, the NIH and IDSA guidelines for remdesivir is that you uh, start them on patients who are hospitalized and requiring nasal cannula, uh, but not once they're on mechanical ventilation or ACMA. So now moving on to immunomodulators, uh, I think one of the trials that showed uh, was a landmark, landmark trial, uh, thankfully a little bit on the, in the middle of the pandemic that showed some positive um, improvement in mortality, it was a UK trial where they randomized a two to one ratio into dexamethasone versus placebo. And this trial was actually halted early because it was the first drug to show mortality benefit. And as you can see here, there was an overall mortality benefit, but the patients who benefited the most uh, with regards to improving 28-day mortality was the patients who were requiring mechanical ventilation. And also the patients requiring oxygen, but if you look here, the patients that were not on oxygen actually had a trend towards uh, no benefit and maybe worsening outcomes. This is a meta-analysis that basically looked at seven different trials um, and seeing the benefits of uh, the number of deaths with regards to using dexamethasone. And some of these trials use dexamethasone, some of them use hydrocortisone, some of them used uh, methylprednisolone. But the predominant uh, trial that took over the outcome with a weighted of about, what, 57% was the recovery trial. And there was a, a trend towards improvement in mortality. So now I'm going to move on to the IL-6 inhibitors. Uh, the first trial that came out was uh, basically looking at tocilizumab or cerulimab versus the control. Uh, predominantly the tocilizumab, and basically the enrollment were patients who were 
in the ICU uh, early on because everything, everything that we do is we try to do it as early as possible, our interventions to try to reduce that inflammatory state. It was patients that were requiring high flow nasal cannula and at the time, the standard of care was predominantly using dexamethasone uh, because of the recovery trial. And so about 88% were receiving dexamethasone on top of the IL-6 inhibitor. The primary endpoint at this one was combi combined mortality days free of organ uh, support. And when you compared that to placebo, there was an improvement um, and also an improvement in mortality. Uh, a follow-up trial in the UK uh, just used uh, tocilizumab as their IL-6 inhibitor compared to usual care. Again, the majority of patients were getting steroids. Um, and as you can see here, there is a reduction in mortality, 28 mortality, a reduction in progression to require mechanical ventilation or death, and actually a uh, improvement in discharge at 28 days when, uh, for the patients who were re uh, receiving tocilizumab. And again, the inclusion criteria were patients who were already uh, having a progression of disease when increased inflammatory markers that were hypoxic requiring oxygen and the majority of them were requiring non-invasive mechanical ventilation. Uh, this uh, highlights the importance of administer administering the medications early on. So the patients who benefited the most were those who uh, received the medication uh, less than seven days uh, since onset of symptoms. Uh, the patients who were also receiving uh, corticosteroids, um, and, and those are the patients who basically had the best uh, outcomes. Moving on to the JAK inhibitors, the baricitinib, bar um, and this one uh, basically showed improved to time recovery when given when remdesivir in patients who require supplemental oxygen, but this trial didn't include the patients who were actually receiving steroids, so keep that in mind. So there was a follow-up where actually the standard of care uh, was that the steroids were administered, and that one was the COVID barrier trial. 80% um, of the patients were, re were receiving uh, cortical steroids. The primary endpoint was death or progression to high flow or non-invasive mechanical ventilation, mechanical ventilation, or ECMO. And there was no significant difference, but the secondary endpoint that they looked at was all-cause mortality, and there was a 38% risk reduction. So based on uh, the, that literature, the NIH and IDSA guidelines, for baricitinib and tocilizumab is that if the patients are requiring an admission um, and um, therefore that we're, we're recommending baricitinib or tosi uh, with dexamethasone alone or in combination with remdesivir, if the patients are on high flow, non-invasive, or they have evidence of progression of disease in order increasing oxygen demand or high inflammatory markers, um, but for, and the same thing for the IDSA guidelines. <clears throat> So this is just basically a summary to kind of highlight that we have some algorithmic approach to treatment plans for patients. So if patients are hospitalized but do not require oxygen, we recommend against dexamethasone because there's insufficient data that there's actually benefit and potentially may be harmful. Uh, however, in patients who are hospitalized and require supplemental oxygen, then we recommend remdesivir or the combination of dexamethasone with remdesivir if you see that the patients are requiring um, increasing amounts of uh, oxygen support or dexamethasone when you're unable to use remdesivir. Um, and then if they continue to progress and their oxygen demand continues to increase, therefore patients requiring high flow or non-invasive mechanical ventilation, then we, we recommend the dexamethasone or the combination of dex remdesivir, but at this point you're adding on the bercetinib or the tocilizumab to the above. Um, and then hospitalized requiring invasive mechanical ventilation or ACMO, we are recommending that obviously dexamethasone be given, but if you, within the first 24 hours, adding on the IL-6 inhibitor. So we do have these algorithmic ways of treating our patients, and despite that, we are seeing uh, disparities among certain populations. 
and most importantly highlighted in this talk is going to be those four black and latin communities you know in it, it, it's been really hard as somebody from you know a hispanic background latinx community to see the disproportionately uh, affected patients coming from these communities and you know we're going to go into a little bit of detail why we think these um, these populations are disproportionately affected. I'm going to start off by talking about this Milwaukee County study uh, that was basically conducted in a large academic center during the early phases of pandemic uh, back in March of 2020. Keep in mind that in Milwaukee County, there's a large uh, African American population, about 30%. Uh, this uh, study included about 2,500 patients, and being African American put you at higher risk uh, to test positive for COVID-19, and the proportion of three or more core morbidities was higher in African American uh, patients compared to non. Uh, poverty status was higher in Blacks as well. Being COVID positive was associated with Afri being African American male um, and age of 60 or greater. And this study basically shows that even after adjusting for zip code, black patients and living in poverty increase your chances of being hospitalized. Although poverty was not associated with ICU admissions, um, neither race nor poverty was associated with death or the need of mechanical ventilation. But we did see that you were more likely to test positive and more likely to be hospitalized. So we know that um, that race matters when it comes to healthcare. That even uh, when you account for many different confounders, such as you know where you live, what insurance status you have, how much money your family makes, et cetera, um, you know there are disparities that exist at different levels of healthcare uh, when it comes just to race and ethnicity. And so the question is, are our patients um, from Black and Latinx communities uh, being treated uh, differently uh, than white patients? Since this study really looks at that issue critically, uh, looking at over 44,000 uh, Medicare beneficiaries retrospectively, and they're comparing care for Black and white patients and, and outcomes. And you can see that after, uh, even before, in an unadjusted sample, um, that the rate of mortality or discharge to hospice within 30 days of admission was higher in the black uh, compared with the white uh, patients. Um, now, we know that black individuals, as we've discussed, have a higher rate of comorbidities um, that put them at higher risk for, um, for complications of COVID-19, more likely to come from um, impoverished backgrounds, et cetera. But when you start to adjust for those factors, um, we would expect that disparity to resolve and there be to be more parity uh, between the white and black populations in the study. Instead, the opposite actually happened. So there was a, there was a larger difference in the adjusted analysis, which was uh, surprising. And it very much depended on the, on the place you were admitted, that some hospitals and health systems seem to do a very good job of keeping uh, those, those rates of mortality and um, hospice discharge uh, low overall and similar between black and white patients, and others uh, did not. And in fact, accounting for that difference, if uh, you could see that if black patients were admitted to those same hospitals, which were performing at a higher level, um, the risk of mortality uh, for black, uh, black patients uh, would go down. So I think what this calls out to me is that disparities persist and it's not a surprise because we know hospital care has been biased in, in other ways that promotes uh, worse health outcomes uh, for black patients. And I go back to what Denora was describing in those NIH-based algorithms. You know, they're not based on race. And so we really should be looking at those as our guiding light. Of course, those guidelines change. We've had to become very used to being not completely comfortable with what's going on in COVID-19 care because something breaks every day and we have to, you know, we have to respond to it. But we really want to try to maintain that same high standard of care uh, for everyone. And I think that it begins uh, certainly uh, with using the best evidence that's out there and algorithms that we know can make a difference, particularly for this worst outcome of all mortality. And uh, Denora is going to highlight some other um, some other issues around using those standards of care, uh, in, particularly in the inpatient setting. Yeah, so you know this this is an interesting trial. That it's a basically a retrospective cohort study that was looking at the utility of remdesivir, hydroxychloroquine, and dexamethasone, and it looked at forty different health systems in the nation. Um, it included about one hundred and forty thousand COVID nineteen patients. And if you if you see here. 
um, looking at the data that dexamethasone and remdesivir use really varied across health centers, but not only varied across health centers, but also varied among uh, ethnicity. So whites uh, versus black and Hispanics with regards to remdesivir, there's a, a very difference in percentage of the utility of remdesivir and also dexamethasone, which you know I'm actually pretty surprised that about 45% of patients um, ended up on dexamethasone in, in the white population, but much more decreased in the black and Hispanic population. And even for those patients who were on mechanical ventilation, and that's where we saw the most benefit when it came to the recovery trial. So, you know, there's variation in patient case mix, drug access, treatment protocols, quality of care, but we know that there's like an implicit bias. So trying to take that out by placing these uh, strategies to reduce that with algorithms, like you mentioned, um, is important. Um, and, you know, despite the fact that we have uh, algorithmic ways to uh, come up with treatment plans for these patients, you can't really completely reduce uh, some of the things that we, you know, have basically affect these communities that we can't really change yet. And those are the determinants of health. We can't change in the short term, but, you know, we can try to change for the long term. And I feel like COVID-19 has basically just highlighted um, the, the issues that we have affecting these low-income uh, communities. And, you know, although the majority of determinants of health is predominantly behavioral patterns, those behavioral patterns are with regards to patterns of obesity and inactivity and being, being one of the predominating factors. Uh, experience demonstrated as possible to change behavior as illustrated by increased education and access to healthier foods and areas to safely partake in and exercise uh, if feeling safe around their neighborhood and parks and access to primary care and therefore uh, good uh, preventative care. And, you know, the, these are some of the things that basically just highlight what I just discussed, economic stability, patients having good employment, not having to work multiple jobs that they don't have enough time to exercise. Uh, the fact that they have medical bills to pay and expenses of debt, uh, neighborhoods, like I mentioned, safety in the park area, playgrounds, walkable, uh, walkability areas where they feel safe. Uh, the zip code, you're going to highlight something uh, pretty soon that's so important with regards to where patients live and how that changes uh, life expectancy, education, uh, health literacy, understanding what your, what your doctor is explaining to you, um, language barriers, uh, early childhood education, higher education, access to good food, um, you know, not having uh, liquor stores at every corner of your neighborhood and uh, uh, unhealthy options, uh, community and social context, social integration, you know, having community engagement, healthcare systems, you know, healthcare coverage being underinsured or uninsured. Uh, and so all of those things really affect the outcome of these patients. And so, you know, I wanted to highlight some of these quotes that I think are very important to keep in mind, you know, and, um, you know, this one I think really hits hard, uh, hits home, I would say hits home, um, is that, you know, we need to make sure that we validate and debunk hypotheses about these intrinsic biological susceptibilities that patients from low-income communities have and make sure that we understand and engage in the fact that we need to change the structural racism that's innate that COVID-19 has basically highlighted. So I'm gonna let you guys go ahead and read some of these quotes what I think that I think are important. All right, so um, thanks, Denora. Uh, so um, just to summarize before we get to, I, th I think a, a very good closing argument uh, for this presentation today, which won't be given by uh, Denora or myself, um, we know that being Black, Amer American Indian, Alaska Native, or Latinx is associated with a high risk of COVID-19 infection, high risk of hospitalization, high risk of death. That's primarily due to those social determinants. And Denora, thank you for being such a champion and it's clear your passion about those social determinants of health. And we should all try to be advocates uh, for improving those conditions that make our communities and our patients sick. Um, 
monoclonal antibody treatments uh, really are a uh, strong therapy available to reduce healthcare utilization, that's hospitalization, emergency department use, and the risk of mortality. Um, and they should be used for outpatients, high risk of uh, COVID-19 complications um, that could lead to hospitalization. Vaccinated or no, still give them monoclonal antibodies um, if, they, uh, if they're at high risk for, uh, for complications and try to get those on board right away. Um, antiviral treatments for remdesivir, this is the FDA approved uh, treatment for all hospitalized patients. Remember that it's more effective in patients who are receiving oxygen, but who are not on mechanical ventilation or ECMO. Um, and you want to use these agents, uh, particularly if you're talking about an antiviral agent, you know, ASAP. Um, whereas dexamethasone, you know, for more uh, severe cases, um, has been associated with lower mortality rates in uh, patients who have used severe critical illness. And like I said, so we know the disparities are, are quite real, but it's one thing to hear statistics, um, but it's, it's another thing to hear patients describe it. I'm sure you all have experience with this, but there's a, there's a particular patient story that I think is worth calling out. And um, I'm going to let uh, Kim kind of put, draw this session to a close for us. I really was feeling bad and I knew something was wrong. So when I did wake up that Friday morning, I drove myself to the ER. The doctor came and she said, we can send you home on some oral antibiotics. I said, if I stay here, will I get the antibiotics I beat? And she said, yes. And I said, I think I wanna stay. But I did that because I was scared. The nurse that was taking care of me that day, I requested to her that she um, contact the doctor because I had been on every antibiotic and my temperature was still 104. And he said, we're going to test you for a respiratory panel. We're going to test you for HIV. And we're going to test you for the coronavirus. I just hear someone screaming in the hallway. And I told my girlfriend, I said, that's my mom. So my girlfriend gets up to see, was that really my mom? And when she got up and went out the door, a security guard came and slammed the door closed. And I'm banging on the window, banging on the window, trying to know what's going on. The security guard kept his back to the door the whole time. I turned the wheelchair around and I looked up at the television. We are told, in fact, that there is a person who is being treated in New Orleans that is from Jefferson Parish right this now. This is a person who has contracted the coronavirus. They are from Jefferson Parish, but again, they are at the VA hospital in New Orleans getting treatment right now. Who do you think that was? Wow, thank you um, to D Dr. Vega and Shinshia so much for all the invaluable information and for letting us hear Kim's story today. Fantastic, thank you for that. And as a reminder, as we move into the Q&A, uh, you can continue to submit those on your console and we will try to get to as many as time allows today. Uh, so here's our first question. Is there an alternative to steroids that can be used in a patient with diabetes who is on mechanical ventilation? If you want to get, take that uh, question, uh, Chuck. Uh, so the the short answer is no. We don't have specific medications uh, that would that have been studying in this and that specific population. But there are ways to, to mitigate uh, hyperglycemia, and so because there's such a big benefit in mortality when patients are in mechanical ventilation, diabetes itself can be treated with insulin. So. Um, I would say the, that no, we don't have alternatives. Okay, thank you very much. And um, going on the same theme of dexamethasone, I still see providers prescribing dexamethasone for COVID-19 patients with shortness of breath who are discharged from the ER. What are your thoughts? Well, I, I can start this one, but I want to know as the pulmonary specialist, her take on it too. So you're, you're you're potentially exposing your patient to danger by giving a drug like dexamethasone because it's likely going to uh, reduce their immune function temporarily while they're trying to fight a, a significant respiratory pathogen. So that's 
that's a potential downside, whereas the upside for, for patients with more mild disease really hasn't been proven yet, so I would avoid it. The one case where I, I have had some conflicts is uh, what about folks with chronic respiratory illness? They have COPD or they have asthma. We know that a major trigger for exacerbations uh, is uh, viral respiratory illnesses. And in the past, it was fine. You know, we'd go ahead and place them on a, uh, on a course of steroids. Usually a shorter course is better because even short course of steroids can have side effects. Um, but I, didn't, I wasn't so much concerned about it before COVID-19. So that is really more of a conundrum because I really want to you know, manage the inflammatory component while not suppressing their immune function. I don't know, Janora, if you have a take on that because I'm just judging it on case by case basis. And patients who really feel like this is more an exacerbation, a little bit longer in the course of their illness, they've, had, they've been sick for six days now and they have a history of you know, moderate asthma, I, I'm gonna think about putting them on say a, a course of prednisone. No, yeah, I agree with you 100%. Um, on, in the, even in the acute setting, I would say if patients are endorsing, you know, if they have underlying uh, lung diseases like asthma, COPD, and all those things, I would definitely wouldn't hold back in that population because you have to understand the patients who uh, were included in that UK trial, they didn't have a subgroup analysis to see, you know, who had those lung chronic diseases to see if it was a difference. But I wouldn't treat them any differently that we do other respiratory viral illnesses that affect those with uh, chronic lung diseases. If they do have an asthma exacerbation or a COPD exacerbation, I would teach to uh, treat them with that dose that we usually give that patient population. Outside of that, I wouldn't, uh, just because the literature, again, doesn't support that there's benefit and there's maybe some harm associated with it. And just follow those patients closely. Can never go wrong with that. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, uh, next question. Are monoclonal antibodies still recommended if you're vaccinated but high risk? Uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, certainly one of the things we've seen depressingly over the past uh, several weeks has been a, a small group of individuals who were fully vaccinated and still acquiring COVID-19. Um, so um, I've been recommending monoclonal antibodies. There's not really a strong interaction there. They should still be protective in preventing the complications of COVID-19. But again, just another reason for everyone to, to be vaccinated who's 12 years and over right now. Okay. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. So uh, here's one about the Delta variant. So are people infected with the Delta variant presenting with the same symptoms as earlier variants? I have heard more GI symptoms are present. Do you know why you want right. to take a stab at that one? Or? So, you know, as far as in the inpatient side, I'm still seeing the same presentation. I don't know if patients are presenting differently in the outpatient setting with that majority of like 80%, but the people who are presenting on the inpatient side, it's the same typical symptoms as the other variants, which are primarily respiratory. Yeah, and, and I've heard about, you know, that there's more GI symptoms um, associated with uh, the Delta variant, which usually is about 20% of patients. Uh, present with GI symptoms and overall GI symptoms. So it's it's not uncommon to have GI symptoms uh, associated with COVID-19, but this is back pre-Delta. So it's a minority of patients, but it is there. I, have, I haven't seen any literature that really supports. We're still wondering, is the Delta variant certainly more transmissible? Not proven that it's more virulent, that it actually will put more patients in the hospital, in the ICU, or have a higher mortality rate. And I still see a, a quite variable uh, and protein uh, kind of uh, symptomatology associated with COVID-19 involving multiple symptoms at, 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 at the same time. So I'm not, I'm not, I, I personally, in my practice, have not seen it move the needle that much in the past several weeks. Okay. Um, so two more questions here. The first one is, are the antibodies that you spoke about effective against the Delta variant? The monoclonal antibodies we talked about, yeah, I think there's a question as to what are the monoclonal antibodies. So just to just to uh, go through it again, it's casivirimab plus indevimab, sotrovimab. Those are the currently um, active antibodies, that, monoclonal antibodies that we should be using against uh, COVID-19 in the outpatient setting. And yes, they are active against Delta. So, so that's been demonstrated in vitro and seems to be have good results in vivo as well. Um, so therefore, we're, we're still underusing uh, monoclonal antibodies. We should be using them more often. Well put. Okay, so for those unable to get vaccinated or unvaccinated, 
um, but had moderate COVID and continued positive antibodies. Is there any evidence of a needed antibody titer from natural immunity that can provide safety from future infection? Well, I can jump in and say that the, so the, the level of what constitutes immunity from COVID-19 in terms of antibodies has not been established. And of course, that's just one form of immunity. It doesn't account for cellular immunity either. Um, and even the way that those antibodies are measured has been variable from lab to lab. So not a strong role for serology. Um, and I just tell patients, yes, you have some protection. We know that protection is not as strong in terms of antibodies that you get as the protection you get from the vaccine. Therefore, we should get the you should get the vaccine, and even with Delta, that will you, know, you should be very well protected um, against particularly severe illness with COVID nineteen. Yeah, and even in the vaccinated, the um, the antibody production, we still don't quite understand. You know, we're, we, there's a lot of talks about the booster and whether or not uh, it's indicated because we, like you mentioned, the cellular immunity, like and how it plays a role in long-term uh, immunity. Fantastic. Well, thank you to both of you for answering all of those questions. I do see that there are a couple more coming in. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time today, but please do stay tuned for our upcoming webinars and maybe we will address these on our next section. So um, for our audience, if you'd like to claim credit, please click the claim credit button. That will appear when the webcast ends. Also be on the lookout for our 30 day survey. You'll receive that through email. And as always, your responses will help us develop further education. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Dr. Chinchia, Dr. Vega, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, Faith. Thank you, Denora. Thank you. Thank you.